Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Matt Witkowski. I'm the Richard Nellen Sandor Chair and Curator of Photography and Media at the museum and Vice President for Strategic Art Initiatives. Uh, and I'm delighted to see you all here uh, tonight. Why don't we get an image on the screen? Um, you're here to listen to what will be a fabulous conversation between Kwame Samori Brathwaite and Ayana Contreras talking about music, photography, and archives connected to the exhibition, Things Well Worth Waiting For, um, <clears throat> on the, uh, the artist, the multi-sided artist, Kwame Brathwaite. Um, <clears throat> the exhibition, and I hope uh, you've seen it, it's over in the Modern Wing in the Buxbaum Gallery on the ground floor. Um, it gives us an insight into uh, the late photographer's work in fashion, in music, um, and of course, as a photographer, giving visual form to the Black is Beautiful movement from the early 1960s onward. Uh, this is the first public program since Kwame Brathwaite passed on. And you know, that's, that's always a deep moment. We're honored, uh, we're honored to present the program, uh, to introduce uh, what is now his legacy uh, and his work to new audiences. A little bit about the speakers. Uh, Kwame Samori Brathwaite is the son of the photographer. He's the director of the Kwame Brathwaite Archive and organizes exhibitions and projects that is explore key themes in his father's work, activism, politics, fashion, and music. Ayana Contreras is a historian, a DJ, an archivist who hosts and produces the weekly program Reclaimed Soul on WBEZ and Vocalo Radio, and has extensive knowledge of 20th century music in Chicago and beyond, so she's really the ideal interlocutor um, with Kwame about Kwame Brathwaite's work to which we are deeply committed. Uh, this exhibition came out of an acquisition of um, a number of works from the archive, and really the show is, is based around um, the Brathwaite archive. Uh, it was organized by Grace Devaney, the David C. and Sarah Jean Ruttenberg Arts Foundation Associate Curator of Photography and Media, made it through that whole title, um, here at the museum. Uh, and. Since these are cycling, I will say that Grace is also um, the wonderful organizer of the Peter Hujar exhibition, Performance in Portraiture, which is on view in the um, other photography and media galleries which are on this side of the campus. Um, tonight's program, sorry to go on, but I must say that it is made possible by the Carol Given Winston Fund. Carol was a museum docent for 38 years, and uh, it's terrific that this fund has been established uh, by her family, friends, and fellow volunteers with the intention of inspiring all those who share Carol's love of art and learning. We're honored to have two of Carol's children in the audience this evening. If I see hands, yeah, there we go. Thank you very, very much for making the program possible. Um, in fact, we have a number of museum volunteers in the audience today. We're grateful for your resolute commitment to the museum and its mission. And the Art Institute's volunteers, yes, more applause. Because we know how deeply you care about making our collections and exhibitions accessible to all audiences, whether it's local Chicago community or visitors from around the world. So thank you. Um, programs like this are at the very core of our mission. We hope you'll have a deeper engagement with this show, with the other exhibitions on view, and see you back here soon. Meanwhile, enjoy. Hi everyone, I'm Grace Devaney, the David C. and Sarah Jean Ruttenberg Associate Curator. Um, I just wanted to um, very briefly welcome you all um, and introduce Ayana and Kwame to the stage. Before that, um, I know we want to dive right into the conversation, but I just wanted to give a little bit more context for the exhibition and its title. 
So Kwame Brathwaite, Things Well Worth Waiting For, explores Brathwaite's rich archive of photographs taken around the globe, the magazines he contributed to as a music reviewer, the albums which featured his work on their covers, and the color slides that gave vivid sense to the many musicians, models, and everyday people he photographed. The exhibition title is borrowed from a preview Brathwaite wrote for Stevie Wonder's album, Songs in the Key of Life, and he gave it this title, Things Well Worth Waiting For, to assure readers that the album, which was a little bit delayed, was going to be well worth waiting for, but he uses that as a refrain throughout this preview to talk about long scales of time related to social justice and other um, forms of human progress. And it really, for me, spoke to something really core about his ways of seeing and thinking about the world, and I wanted to bring that sense to the exhibition. So when it came to organizing this program, Ayana Contreras' deep research on black music and culture in Chicago and beyond seemed like an ideal complement to Kwame Samori Brathwaite's deep knowledge of his father's work. And I'll just quickly give a little bit more bio about each of them. Um, as Matt said, Ayana hosts uh, Reclaimed Soul on WBZ and Vocalo, where she's also the content director. Uh, Contreras is also a columnist for Downbeat Magazine, and her writings have appeared in numerous outlets, including the New York Times, Chicago Review, and Oxford American. She also recently published a book called Energy Never Dies, Afro-Optimism and Creativity in Chicago. And to give you a little bit more information about Kwame Samori Brathwaite, he's the son of the photographer and director of the Brathwaite Archive. He's organized numerous projects related to his father's legacy, including Black is Beautiful with the Aperture Foundation, as well as exhibitions called The Struggle Continues, Victory is Certain, Changing Times, and My Village. Um, I want you to join me in welcoming them both to the stage um, so we can hear more about their contributions to um, engaging with history and archives and representing those and reminding us of all of all the things that are well worth waiting for. So I love to start with a show and tell. So I didn't know your father's name for a long time, but what I knew was when I first started buying records with my own money, there were a group of albums that I was immediately attracted to. People don't remember this, but inside the record, there was a sleeve that usually had album covers that you would want to part, right? You feel what I'm saying? And there were some records. One of them was like Freddie Roach Brown Sugar. You feel me? Your yes. father did that one. Yes. But the one of the first ones that I was able to purchase. Ah was The Natural Soul, Lou Donaldson, which if you came early, that was what was playing in the background. Yes. I mean, I was, this is the 90s we're talking about, so it was a while ago, and when I saw this woman on the cover, I was like, yo, this is, this is like what, um, culturally, I, it just, it, it, it was so resonant in so many ways. Yes. But, this is a side note, it does not have your father's name on here, like as it stands, it says Ronnie. Right. So I didn't put two and two together for quite some time. <laughs> Ronnie, so. But well, what I wanted to ask you about um, is a lot of this work, as was sort of mentioned, is sort of rooted in what I like to call commercial material culture. So like not stuff made for museums necessarily, not stuff made to be, you know what I'm saying, put in a golden frame, but things that were made to live and breathe in people's homes and in people's lives. I wondered, was that something that was something that was important to your father to like get these images out into the hands of like people to inspire people? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Grace. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really to, to address that. I think what he was always doing was um, placing, uh, putting us in a place where we could understand what the world was about for him. And for him, it was about projecting these images of beauty, of pride, 
uh, of self-love out into the world. And so the thing that's really interesting about jazz covers and albums, and I, and I really um, kudos to Blue Note for the, the covers that he um, put out, up until that point, they were generally the musician right. or a very scantily clad woman right. because sex sells. And so for them to then take this totally opposite view, mm -hmm. uh, and it was based off of the relationships that they developed with Lou Donaldson yeah. and Freddie Roach right. and others who had become these people who they had brought to their Club 845 in the Bronx and right. to Smalls Paradise and the Apollo Theater to do these, these concerts, they built that the relationship and the trust to say, hey, let's put this, let's put the image out that we want to see. Right. And so it was very intentional. And, you know, I was talking to someone uh, one time and they actually had this exact album cover and they said they actually did frame it and had it hanging on their wall you very as well art. Could. It's gorgeous. Right. And so um, the fact that it uh, is also my aunt is a really wonderful kind of like side note. But I think. So wholesome. <laughs> but, you know, Noom Sabrath um, was an educator an activist, you know, she ran for um, school assembly um, speaker and all these different things, homeschooled my uh, four of my six male cousins. Like it was, it was all based off of this grassroots um, community based way of projecting imagery out into the world. And this is the thing about the imagery, because I know there's some, some like OGs out here in the audience who, if I don't say this, you're thinking it in your mind. So I'm going to go ahead and verbalize this. The other part about this cover is if you're thinking about it from the perspective of the 1970s, right, like it's not that revolutionary. But this was not the 1970s. This was the early 1960s when the natural look was still considered extremely revolutionary for a black woman. Not only that, but this is a brown skinned woman, right? Like that wasn't what you saw out as being a um, image of beauty in mainstream culture. Now you had a couple of exceptions. You had Cicely Tyson was on East Side, West Side, which was like big deal, right? Like, wow, and she had natural hair in like 1962, like far out. Right, right. But generally speaking, in terms of like the national mainstream media, you didn't, it was very rare still right. in America. Right, yeah, and, and, and to even to touch upon that, you had, you know, Bethanna Hardison, who was a mom. That's right. Yeah. Right? Um, who we just saw the other night. And then um, Naomi Sims, but Naomi Sims generally wore her hair straight, right? Mm -hmm. And so right. the this is quite revolutionary. And really, this is way before, you know, the popularity of the Black Power Movement and all those other struggles. And so what this was was quite revolutionary. And when you look at this cover. Yeah. So the other part of that, I mean, I kind of touched on this concept of sort of material culture, getting the culture out, but your father like worked tirelessly with sort of aesthetic culture, like fashion folks in New York at that time that were like, act, they were putting on fashion shows. You, there's some gorgeous pictures of Abby Lincoln. If you have not seen this show, I highly recommend seeing this show before you leave this building. Um, can you talk about like what was in his mind in uh, documenting all of the aspects of material culture? And when I'm saying material culture, I just love that term, but what I'm really saying is sort of the physical manifestations of the culture. Like the culture is in your mind, but it's also, there's also a lot of important physical ways to represent an Afrocentricity, for instance, like that fashion show sort of is that, that there's a film of in the show um, represents multiple modes of fashion from the motherland and the diaspora more broadly. Right, I think, you know, the entire concept of kind of think black, buy black, black is beautiful, all derived, it, you know, it comes from Garvey and then Carlos Cooks and the Af African Nationalist Pioneer Movement. And they embraced that and they incorporated that. And so what, when they were putting out these shows and they would, they would often do these, um, these shows that were featuring the Grand Dassa models, these women who would um, live this aesthetic of black is beautiful and embrace their African ancestry. Uh, but they lived it. It wasn't just for the show, they lived it. Um, and then uh, as part of those shows, there was often jazz. There were people like Lou Donaldson, Abby Lincoln, and Max Roach, all 
um, performing, but then there was what they called edutainment, right? And so there was, you know, satirical skits. There were things that were talking about black culture in the way in which people were experiencing it during that time. And part of that was to recognize that, you know, the fashions that the women were wearing were created oftentimes by whether it was Carol Lee Prince, who was a designer, who was doing a lot of the jewelry and the fashions, um, or other women who had then started to say, okay, let me pick up um, my sewing machine and start doing things that represented uh, the standards of beauty for us. And so there was not just the, the ideological thing, but it was also the practicality of living it, right? And at one point they had a, a cafe, which was called Grandassa Land, and they, you know, you could go and get food and you could go and spend time and talk about the things that were happening in that day. But ultimately, all of it was really to build this bridge um, throughout the diaspora. Uh, one thing that people don't necessarily know is that a lot of times when you know, freedom fighters from different African nations were coming to petition the UN, they would meet them there and say, hey, come talk to the people in Harlem. Let's bring us together. Let's make this a, an exchange that then became um, the, the ultimate support for places like African Nationalist Pioneer Movement, UNIA and other organizations that then said, okay, let's help. Let's um, figure out how we can help each other in the United States. Let's help each other back in, in, on the continent. But let's help each other throughout the diaspora, uh, which is, in, you know, at, his, um, at my father's funeral that was on uh, April 1st, uh, sorry, April 24th, um, the president of Namibia sent his uh, delegate and, and talked about the fact that they, his role in Pan-Africanism and um, to help Namibia specifically gain its liberation was a big reason why they felt that he was just a giant in this, in this world. And so the way in which he was ensuring that we were thinking about it ideologically, but practically and how we lived it uh, was throughout the way in which he placed his work and the way he worked, uh, went about his, his, um, his photography. Right. Um, I think what's beautiful about a lot of these photos are, to your point, Yes, there's celebrities, right? But there's also this great um, representation of, to your point, a lived culture. Like, this is more than just, I'm going to take this picture for the gram. <laughs> right. We don't know what's in the background. Right. This right. is actually, let me capture this moment in right. time. Right. He was, always, he was always seeking the truth. I think the thing that was um, really incredible, and, and if you haven't seen the show, uh, you'll have the opportunity to see it, but we we venture a bit into not just you know his photography, which is obviously a big part of what and what why people know him, but you you get a sense of his voice because his writing is in the, in the is in the show as well. Uh, and you know one of the things that was the through here in his work is really just music, mm -hmm. right? The way in which music inspires us. Music is the heartbeat of our culture. And so music was this through line uh, that Grace, I think, so eloquently um, captured in, in the way in She Places show. And then just quickly, very quick shout out. All of this is really possible because in uh, a few years back, I went to do, which was my first public speaking engagement at Black Portraiture. And I was sitting there and we kind of finished and um, someone asked me a question about you know where where they could see the work or where the work has been, I answered, being trying to be modest, not necessarily like bragging about what was happening, and then Michal Razuso raised her hand and says, "Hold on, you forgot this place, this place, this place." And I was like, "Who is this woman?" And so we talked after, and when Michal was here at the art um, institute, she essentially was like, "I would really love to really get into the archive," and so. This all started with Michal coming to our storage and really sifting through work. And then after she left and Grace being appointed um, to her position, um, then Grace coming to the archive. So it's really, uh, this started years back and I, I really just, my wife and I were just really fully impressed with both people and, and the way Grace just like brought it all home. So thank you. And thank you, Matt, for making sure that it actually continued to happen. So. I think you bring up a couple of interesting threads. I'm gonna do my best to keep them up here because 
I don't want to write them down. But the first thread that's very interesting is, is the concept of where are these things available for people to see. Um, what I've been talking about all week because I'm weird is on social media, this AI went viral of a, a couple of people know what I'm going to talk about, of this imagery that claimed it was from um, the Players Ball, Chicago 1975, and it's some amazingly dressed black people. First off, totally AI, totally not Chicago, and definitely not 1975 fashion-wise. <laughs> Too many maxi skirts, really more 71, 72 at best. But the point here is, the point here is, like, why that went viral is people are still in this day, the year of our Lord, 2023, starved for historical images of gorgeously dressed, like, rich, self-assured, and when I say rich, I don't mean monetarily rich, I just mean like upright <laughs> black people. Thank you, right, you right. know what I'm talking about. Right. And so like this is an archive that in that sense is more than priceless, yes. right? Um, the other thing that I think about, the other thread, and I, I would love to get your input on it, is a lot of these things were made for mass media consumption, but with this sort of jump to digital a lot of it is not really available. Like to your point, like some of the stuff made the jump to Spotify if it's an album cover, but that's not the ideal way to look at an album cover. A lot of the magazine stuff, maybe the text made it somewhere, but you know, it's just, where is it, you know? Yeah, so <clears throat> to answer that, I think, so part of it is obviously we're still going through the process, right? right. Uh, the Kwame Brathwaite Archive, which is now 501c3, is my wife and I and our family going through the work and really taking it from, you know, he was relatively good about putting things in order and then sometimes he wasn't, right? So getting it into a um, protected and, you know, perfectly managed um, uh, archive, but then also digitizing it. And so that's really what's at the core of all of this, me making sure that the archive is protected. That's what all of this is. It just so happened that, you know, as a result of a play date at my kid's school or, or at my kid's school on the playground, my, my middle son and this little boy are playing together and Philip Martin walks over and introduces himself. Philip Martin is our gallerist and, you know, an incredible gallerist and, and, and started off as a friend. And he was, when, I, when we first started looking at preserving the work, he was like, I can help you do that. So he took me to the Getty Archives. So the first time I'm looking at an archive is in the Getty Archives. And it's just like, oh my gosh, this is what we're supposed to be. This is where we need to go. This is aspirational. This is vision board material. And so taking it and placing the work into the art world was just a matter of Philip using his contacts and bringing it to different people and saying, hey, this is, this is work that I think you should be looking at. And just so happened that Aperture, Michael Famigetti, that Aperture was like, how do we miss this person? And the book was born. And so there are different ways to experience the work, mostly through our book, um, we had a traveling show that was on for four years. The book is Black is Beautiful. It's got kind of an orange cover. Highly recommended. Yeah. Two thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Denisha Ford and Dr. Deb Willis wrote um, the chapters in the book. And so, and my mother's on the cover. Uh, I wanted to make sure we represented my mother, who is my father's muse. Uh, she is the cover image. And so that's one way. And, and, and really the book was set up um, because we were going through the work and saying, okay, this is, it went from a magazine article in Aperture to let's do a book to this looks like a touring exhibition. And so those things came about. And so it's been um, the primary way that people have experienced the work. The thing that I love about this particular exhibition is that it's taking a totally different turn and we're looking at work that he made himself, right? right? So these are, these are C prints. They are his vision, uh, the ones that are, that, that are kind of the more contemporary works. They are his vision, but even the archival, when you look at it, you get a sense of his style, um, his attention to detail, and the way in which he really cared for these photos and the way that he wanted to situate these people and show them. And so um, there are different ways to, ex to experience it. We're working on a couple of different projects that I can't mention quite yet, but we're working on projects where people can experience the work in different ways. 
and we most recently, and you, you mentioned this on Instagram, um, we had an opportunity through a collector, um, Swiss Beats and Lisa Keys, they collect the work and Swiss was doing an album and he was like, I'm doing a jazz album. I need a really beautiful cover. What do you have? And I sent him an image like that. He's it. living the dream. Swiss Beats is living the dream. <laughs> it was, you just like have this work on. Yeah. And so it was this, and you talk about this, you talk about the way in which the work and people are clamoring for this kind of like nostalgia. It's really funny because at the National, National African American Museum of History and Culture, there's a new exhibition that's opening in June. And uh, there's a book that's part of it. And in the Afrofuturism chapter, the cover image is the cover of our book. So image that he took in 1968 is being referred to as Afrofuturism. Just, and, and when you kind of just sit back and think about that, the fact that this, the way in which he envisioned this utopia is actually the same way in which we're envisioning this utopia now is really kind of revolutionary and really kind of mind blowing. But it's re it really speaks to the fact of the timelessness of his work. I mean, this Celia Cruz image is crazy. <laughs> I remember we're going through and looking at this and we're like, I mean, this is, there's not, we, we literally just take the images and put them out and he, he just did such an amazing job, Mini Ripperton. It's just, it's, um, don't talk about Minnie in this piece because there's a lot of. <laughs> it's it's just um, in <laughs> it's it's the it's the constant gift that keeps giving, and so it's really beautiful to be able to even experience the work in which we, we we're doing it. That's the miracles, by the way. <laughs> I was trying to help them. There you go. <laughs> I love it. See, when you get a real music person with these Post images, Smokey. it's like that's important. All, Smokey right. wasn't in there, there so they go. didn't. <laughs> yeah. It's always perfect to have that. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention that's an important distinction is you said nostalgia. I don't really think it's rooted in nostalgia. Now, you, my friend, disclosed that you are technically on the cover of Essence magazine in your mother's belly, 1974. So you, I'm, I say that not to out him, but to say, like, you grew up in this life. Like, this is a reflection of your lived experience and your reality. I am saying that there are generations of people who this can be earth shattering, mind blowing to understand that like this history that is not easily Googleable is not just, not only did it happen, but there is rich, rich proof of its existence and of its impact. Does that make sense? Which I think is different from nostalgia. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. I, I have conversations with a lot of younger photographers who really embrace the work, and they often are like, this is wild. Like, I haven't seen these images, but I feel like they're in the collective, okay. right? And it's, it's similar to the work that I'm putting out when I'm looking at focusing on beauty and focusing on black love and black joy. Uh, people like Tyler Mitchell and Trevor Sturman, like, they're, they're recognizing that there is this through line, whether they saw the images or not. And it was funny, Tyler posted something not too long ago and it was this beautiful, like, this was back, this was a couple years back, and beautiful, like, yellow image. And then I sent him this image, it's, it's not here, um, of Clara Bugs, who was one of the first Grand Assa models, in this, like, yellow backdrop with this yellow flower. And he was like, oh my God, this is, this is like, literally the same, the same feel, the same thought process, the same love. And so there is an interconnectivity, and, and you're right. I think it's, um, it's a bit more than nostalgia. I think people are looking for this way of envisioning who we are uh, in a positive manner. Which was the whole point of right. this movement. Right, exactly. Right? Exactly. Like, exactly. we are going to show you who we are right. in our own way with our own lens, which yes. is important, which is here in Chicago, which I love to call the rare high center of black cultural production in the mid 20th century. Um, we were doing that with Ebony and Jet and yes. you know, all of these other means of getting these images out there. I would also want to mention Vince Colors Advertising and all of the rich black advertising yes. firms who put out iconic images. And I say that because I see it in concert with this work that was happening. I see the community, the um, attempt to like 
public, pub, publicize in mass these images. So like, for instance, with my book, this is not me trying to get you to buy my book, but <laughs> I wanted to tell this story because my book, the cover of the book is literally an Afro Sheen advertisement uh, that uh, it ran for like three years. It was, a, it was purportedly a mother and daughter, but not a mother and daughter, but supposed to be. And the mother is looking at the daughter and kind of like touching her gingerly. And the book is called Energy Never Dies, right? It was almost too on the nose. But the image was taken here in Chicago, Vince Cullors advertising firm, one of the very first black firms in the country um, for Afro Sheen, a black company um, in Ebony, a black business that had the first um, high-rise building downtown owned by a black person, right. architected by a black person. It was just like triple, quadruple black. Right. <laughs> and so I was like, if this isn't the cover of my book, which is supposed to talk about 60s, 70s black culture and how it, in Chicago and how it still inspires a generation today, like what am I doing with my life? <laughs> um, but like that image, what I, I say all that to say, the way that various generations interface with that cover and tell me about how they feel about that cover. Right. Because that's what it is. It elicits a very visceral, positively visceral reaction. Yes. It lets me know that this is something that people really need. Right. Right, the same way you react to that. I mean, you just keep looking. Right. A, <laughs> the same way you react to that. Cover. It's and, just gorgeous. And, and it is. It's, it's, and, and, you know, especially during the pandemic, one of the things that happened was people were, I, there were so many people citing the book as one of the things that, like, just brought their spirits up. It was, like, their way to recharge or way yeah. to reset. Um, it's beautiful. And the imagery, um, you know, it's, it's exactly what it was meant to do. And then on the other side, it's meant to educate, right? So if you didn't know... Um, it, it was really funny, this educate me in, included. Um, I remember one time I was looking at a contact sheet uh, and it was a bunch of Bob Marley images. And I said, you know, Baba, one of the things we have to do is like really kind of figure out, you know, we have to date things, we have to put this in the right uh, order. And I said like, so for instance, like what, what's this date? And he was like, oh, that was June 9th, uh, 1976. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, why do you know that? And he goes, well, I know because we were in Philadelphia. I was like, yeah, but I don't know what I, where I was last week. Like, what do you mean this is June 7th? He goes, well, it was two days before Jimmy Carter declared it Black Music Month, June Black Music Month. I was like, oh, but, but like, how do you know that? He goes, because I was there, right? <laughs> and so it's like this thing. And so, of course, me, I go and I Google it and I'm like, yep, okay, he's right. Um, but it's... The, the beauty of it, especially in the environment that we're in now, where things are just being pulled, information is being pulled from people and hidden from people, taken from schools, like this that serves, part. yeah, this serves as a means of being able to educate. And so um, when it comes to kind of history and culture, I, I love the way in which people are really embracing the work uh, in that way. I also love um, how in this particular exhibition, as well as the other exhibitions, women are centered in a really beautiful way. Sometimes historical things that focus on like black culture sometimes are a little male centric, which look, but in this case, a lot of ladies, which, and not in a pandering way, not in a male gaze way, just like really, really beautiful, respectful, lovely images of women. I mean, I think that's just sort of like, like, what I loved when I caught the Black is Beautiful exhibition at the New York Historical Society that was like January of this year. So not pretty close to when it closed. Yeah, yeah. It was like late January. Um, a lot of ladies were in that spot with fur coats, <laughs> doing a thing. It was the place to be. I was there with my fur coat too, because it was in fact the place to be. But I mean, just watching the way people yeah. were like engaged with the work. But the reason why I wanted to bring that up is back to Abby Lincoln. Um, there's like a number of pictures in yeah. here and in another exhibition. Um, Abby Lincoln is one of my favorite artists. Um, those photos, can you talk a little bit about like how she figured into his world? I'm just curious. Yeah, so um, Abby Lincoln also, um, his favorite song, Throw It Away. Uh, Abby Lincoln and Max Roach were integral in 
establishing who they were and launching the Black is Beautiful movement, which happened January 28, 1962. Uh, and Abby Lincoln was the MC for the day that they um, debuted the Grandassa models, right? These women who lived this standard of beauty. She also went natural pretty early. She went natural very early, so she was already on that. And when you, and when you think about, um, and then Max Roach was also performing, and Abby, and Max, when they traveled, they're the reason why the word spread. They were, they were the influences of their time that really helped really spread the word. So the, I, have, um, I have a contact sheet where there's, they're sitting there with Flip Wilson and they're talking about you know um, the Grand Assa models and Ajaz and the whole thing. And they were the ones that went out when they were going and performing in different places, uh, Chicago, Detroit, you know, all the different cities to really spread the word. And so they had a relationship from early on. Um, they were a part of it from the beginning. And, you know, Miles Davis is one of the first kind of like supporters financially of the work that they were doing. But Abby was, played an incredibly important role because she, again, just like the Grand Nassau models, she was living it. She turned down multiple roles because they wanted her to wear hair straight or do other things. And she was like, no, I'm going to be me. I'm going to embrace who I am. Same thing, you know, with um, the way in which they kind of went about doing the work that they were doing and spreading the word. So I really love, you know, what's happened currently in the way in that I'm kind of bringing the work back to, to, to the masses. And it's people like Jesse Williams and Alicia Keys and Swiss Beats and others, Rihanna, who are the ones who are kind of putting the work out into the world and helping us spread the word about bringing it back. And so um, they're, they're like my, Kind of age as, but and and just to go back to what you're talking about about the role and the way in which women are portrayed, there's reverence and there's respect, which is really important. You think about you think about it. It's 1956. African American people are still referring themselves as Negro, and they called themselves the African Jazz Art Society and Studios, and they took the concept of the Grandassa models, which was Grandassa land, which is what Carlos Cusco referred to as Africa. The whole um, notion of one, the um, the whole notion of their, them being, you know, men being here, women being here, they were equally out there deciding on what was going on, deciding on what was put out into the world, which was really impressive to me. And something that I was thinking about when we were doing the book, because Tanisha was like, I want to sit down with all the women and talk to them, and she actually kicked my father and I, out of my friend's apartment, was like, no, I got to talk to the ladies. I got to get the real deal. Um, so it was really beautiful to see that, you know, women's rights are still not where they're supposed to be. But even back then, in 62, 61, 62, they were like, no, we're doing this together. And this is part of how we're going to do things. So it's, um, it's always been impressive to me that both they are embracing their ancestry, but also keeping, you know, men and women on level playing ground, which was really important for them. Yeah, so I'm trying to think what I'm making sure. Let me see. I did write down something. Okay. Um, the archive. Yes. Okay, so I know that you can't talk about a lot of what's going on with the archive, but I w did want to ask you a very specific point because I have very specific feelings about archives. Okay. Um, in terms of like um, archives in institutions. Sure. So, like, you said, right? You feel me? So <laughs> you were saying that you wanted to, you know, preserve the archive and stabilize the archive, which 100%. But you also mentioned that you wanted to make sure to maintain the archive, like, in your family. Yes. Explain to me that decision process. So, you know, there are multiple ways that you can work with an archive. You can, uh, and most people do this. If you look at the Bruce, Bruce's Beach case, like, people figure out that they own something and then they oftentimes will sell it. I thought it was a mistake for them to do that. I think it's a mistake for some people, depending on if you have the people and the dedication um, to preserve something. Like, look, if you don't have, if you're someone who has this uh, immense work and you don't have someone who can take care of it for you, I think it's a wonderful thing to find an amazing institution and just whether gift it to them or you know, have them acquired or whatever it is. For us, it was really important, and then this came directly from my father. He did not see a lot of financial success during his career. He, the breadth of his work is 
pretty much incom incomparable. What he always said was, this is what I'm leaving to you and to your children and to their children. And so for us, and the fact that we've you know, taken on this task, for us, it's really important for us to get it to a point where it's you know, organized and established and it's a searchable database that can be utilized. And then the partner with institutions to then say, okay, you know, maybe we write a grant together and tackle this portion of it. Maybe we'll work together and, you know, this is on loan for a certain number of years. I think it's really important for people to see the work. The most important thing for me is to get it archived and also to have people experience it. Because, look, I, I love working and being in the fine art world, but I think it's really important for people to know the story, for That's people right. to experience the work and all of that. And then I think, you know, those things will develop. And as more people want to see more of it, then there'll be other opportunities. But I think for me, that's really what's most important. And it's, you know, the Obama hair touch, that little boy touching Obama's hair. I love when I go into these places and you see younger people, whether they're curators or children or, you know, college or whatever, going in and seeing themselves on the walls. And that, for me, is part of the really important part of why we want to maintain this archive because you know, I think when you go into or spaces like this, which is a really amazing institution, and you come in and you see that, that's, that's life changing. That changes, you know, Kinda Wiley talked about that, not seeing those things on the wall and he want, him wanting to change that. And so when you have the ability to, to have that experience and have, you know, whether it's a college or an institution or a museum or whatever it is, experience the work and show the work, that's what's important to me. So even when sometimes, you know, we'll have an acquisition, I'm often, and Philip can attest to this, I'm always like, when are they gonna show the work, right? I, I want the work to be out into the world. It's great to have the private collectors have it and they, they, they just keep it within their circle, but that's not, the, that's not what this is about. What he wanted was people to see the work, people to see it on a large scale, for people to experience it right. and see the things that were really important That's to right. him. There's a term us. they don't use anymore, mass media. Yeah. Like when this message was disseminated through mass media, yeah. there was real power in that. I know we talk about social media, but that concept of mass media, you never know who it's going to hit and who it's going to impact. Right. Is, it's, 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 it's interesting. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.